Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Dental Call. This is a, a monthly program where we explore the business side of dentistry with industry experts. I'm your host, Steve Kaufman. I'm a dental lawyer in Baltimore who helps uh, dentists and dental practices uh, all over the country solve your legal problems. Whatever you guys bump into, that's what I do. Uh, today, I am pleased to introduce to you uh, our expert, David Harris, who comes to us from Halifax, Canada. Uh, David is dentistry's embezzlement expert. He's the owner of the largest company in the world devoted to rooting out embezzlement in dental offices. Um, he's the guy uh, that over, well, thousands, of, well, I'll let David speak for himself, but um, they only work with dentists. It's all they do. He's a true expert. Uh, and everybody, anybody who doesn't know, we're recording this call. And when we're done talking to David, uh, we're going to open up the lines and folks can ask questions. And with that, good afternoon, David. Hey, Steve. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. Hey, before we get into talking about uh, stealing from dentists, uh, to give, give folks some background on yourself. How would you get into this business? What, what's your story? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, my my company has been at this for 30 years, so we started in 1989. Um, before I got involved in working with dentists, I was in the Army for a while, and I was in the Army because I'd gotten in some trouble with the law, and uh, a, a very nice judge gave me a choice of uh, join the Army or go to jail. So the, <laughs> the, Army, the Army sounded like a much better plan. Um, yes. And... Um, I had I had left the army. I worked for a bank for a few years. I'd quit my job with the bank, and I was sitting at home, thinking about what I was going to do next. And one of those things happened that changes your life. The phone rang, and it was a guy I'd been in high school with, who is now a dentist. And he said to me, "I think my front desk person's stealing from me, and I don't have anyone else to call." So he caught me at the right time because I really wasn't doing much. So I said to him, "No problem." Uh, I'll meet you tonight at your practice after it closes, and we'll get to the bottom of this. So wow. I went I went to his practice, and um, this is back before most dentists computerized, and they were using the old system that uh, was called Pegboard, which was kind of a manual accounting system. And so I found out what she was doing. She was stealing, and, and, and I found it fairly quickly. And I came back the next morning to help the doctor fire this person. And the dentist promised to buy me dinner that I'm still waiting for, but that's a whole other story. And, Charge him interest. Yeah, and I and I I went home and promptly forgot about it, and you know didn't didn't think about this as a career or anything else. But that all changed two weeks later. Two weeks after we fired this gal, I was going into my own dentist's office for. A regular appointment and try to imagine what went through my mind when I was about to go th through the front door into his practice and I looked through the glass and I saw sitting there at his front desk the same woman that we fired at the other practice two weeks ago oh my okay what I what I said was a little less printable than that but you have the right <laughs> idea um, not not a very good background check. They they forgot to call the references when they hired her, I suppose. They certainly did. Um, and so I, I ran to a payphone because in those days a cell phone was like the size of a briefcase and called the practice and I got I got put through to the doctor on a bit of a pretext. And once I got him on the phone I, I told him about what what was going on at his front desk. And he asked me in this panicked voice, what the hell do I do now? And about a sentence and a half later, he hired me. It's a good start. That's, that's, that's good. I like that. That's a, that's, a, that's a nice, interesting way to get into a business, by accident. No, no planning whatsoever. Just, um, just kind of happened. And by the time I finished with, with that guy's work... Uh, a couple of his friends had called me, and 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 there's no looking back. Wow, how many how many dentists you suppose you've helped since the, those first two? Oh gosh, uh, I've I've stopped counting, but um, you know it would be thousands. 
and you're up you're up in Canada mm-hmm. and uh, how big is the company just you know, well and our, many- our head office our head office is in Canada which which sounds grandiose but it's a it's a total of six people and uh most of our investigators live somewhere in the US and and they're scattered all over the continent geography is not terribly important to what we do most of most of our work now is done through the cloud so you can you can pretty much live anywhere and do the work um so you know we've got team members in um Texas and Tennessee and four in California I think and um New Hampshire that, and really just that, kind of is, is that is, is that a statement on California or just they're just big <laughs> well it's the it's the most populous state so uh, you know, when we hire, we're looking for people with a certain set of qualifications, and uh, we we probably have a better chance of finding those people in California than Rhode Island. Got it, got it, got it. All right, so let's with 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 that, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, embezzlement and dental practices. First off, kind of what what are the odds? I'm a dentist. What are the odds somebody on my staff is stealing from me? Um. There are some measurement issues in in coming up with a precise number, and I'll uh, I'll give you what we know. Um, published statistics say that your lifetime probability of being embezzled is something between sixty and seventy percent. That wow! Number is so if I'm a, if I'm a dentist over thirty years, if I've got a practice for thirty years, the odds are sixty seventy percent that at some point somebody's stealing from me. That's right, and the true number is probably higher. Um, there's some embezzlement that never gets detected. There's also some that the doctor finds and deals with but doesn't tell anybody anywhere. And um, those two aren't those two numbers which aren't quantifiable aren't in that sixty to seventy percent. The true number's higher and I just don't know by how much. Got it, got it. So so the the odds are, so you might not have anybody stealing from you today, but the odds over time are somebody is. Um all right. and so, if, if you if you if you look at the amount of time that the average theft goes on divided by that thirty year career, um there's probably a ten to twelve percent chance that any audience member is being stolen from today. Wow. So it, Put, put a number on that. How, how long does the typical theft go on? Before, and I'm assuming this is before it's discovered. Yeah. Well, once it's discovered, it stops. But um, it it typically goes on for somewhere between 18 months and two years. Wow. And the average amount that a thief steals to the point where they get caught is over a hundred thousand dollars. Wow, a hundred thousand bucks over a two-year period. That's right. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, that 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 hurts the practice. It also hurts the employed dentist who's getting paid uh, a percentage of collections. Everybody's getting burned here. Every, everybody's getting burned. Um, patients may be victims as well. Um, you know, there's there there are dentists who have terminated their careers early because they got embezzled. Um, I guess the opposite is probably true as well. There are probably some who have hung on too long. Uh, because they had to recoup losses that that they had from theft, um, which you know hurts new dentists coming out who who want practice opportunities. Um, there there are no winners here. Wow, oh, interesting. All right, so let, let's 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 talk about how to how to, how to how to minimize the damage here. What um, I've got a practice. What should I be looking for to give me some indicia? You know, how do I know when I've got a thief? Somebody's embezzling. What do I look for? Um, well, the, the way you know is you, you, you read the report we give you after we investigate, and then you know. Um, <laughs> what, what causes you to suspect? Um, yes, there we go. Here, 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 here's, an, here's an interesting fact that, that I wish more dentists knew. Um, the American Dental Association did a study about 10 years ago, and what they did was they asked embezzlement victims, what prompted your discovery? And... The interesting part is that two-thirds of the discovery, more than two-thirds of the discovery came not because of some kind of financial anomaly in the practice, but because of a behavioral one. In other words, the way the thief was acting. So if if I can give any accumulated wisdom to the audience, it's that the best way to see if you 
have a problem is to watch the behavior of staff. So to, to ex explain that a little bit more. What am I looking for? Um, there are a lot of potential clues. A big one is territoriality. The office manager who's really possessive about her job. I mean, I was talking to somebody yesterday who said, yes, the my wife also works in the practice. My wife is not the office manager, but she works in the practice. The office manager did not want to share certain information with my wife. Hmm. That's an eyebrow raiser. It is definitely an eyebrow raiser. Um, so possessiveness about their duties, knowledge about certain things, not wanting to cross-train people to do their jobs. Uh, embezzlers often don't even like somebody else sitting at their desk or touching their computer. So they, they, they get very territorial. And that's a, that's a big symptom. Um, All right. So re resistance to change is another one. You know, they're they're doing something now that allows them to steal, and they're concerned that some kind of change in the practice, which might even be just a um, installing a newer version of the practice management software, might interfere with what they're doing. So they 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 tend to fight that stuff fairly uh, aggressively. Wow. Okay. So we've got we've got people who don't want to don't want to share their jobs and don't want to change. And what else What else do we look for? Uh, a lot of thieves like alone time in the practice. So when you're stealing, you often want to do it when nobody else is around, and it, it's partly because you don't want oversight or you know somebody to see you doing something you shouldn't be, and it's partly because stealing takes concentration, and it's a little bit difficult to concentrate when patients are, are flying through the practice and, you know, the doctor keeps uh, asking you for things and so on. So these people will try to engineer it so that they get alone time. And they might come in early or they might stay when the practice closes or, you know, they'll come by for a couple of hours on a Saturday or they'll get, uh, they'll get you to give them remote access to the practice management software so that they can have their alone time at home. Ah, so do you? Um, hmm, I'm, I'm going to save my question until we get done with the list on that. I want to. I want to hold that question on remote access. Okay. Don't let, don't let me forget that one, David. I'm, I'm right. writing it down. Um, there we go. All right. I wrote it down too. All right. So we've got two territorial. They want alone time. What What are some other red flags that we should be looking for? This one depends a little bit on the pattern of theft that an embezzler is using, but a lot of embezzlers are very reluctant to take vacation. Hmm. And keeping the reason for that is? Because keeping their theft undiscovered requires them to control how information flows through the practice. So, so give us an explanation. Give, give us some, give us, what do you mean by that? What kind of flow, what, what, are, what are they trying to control? Well, the kind of thing that can happen, for example, is that um, people's statements that they get from the practice management software have um, anomalies or errors in them. And some of the patients will call. And, and the call might go along the lines of this. You know, I was in two weeks ago, I had some work done, and I paid cash for my appointment, but... I just got my bill and my my statement from you in the mail, and the statement says that I paid by credit card. Like that's that's the kind of phone call that might be generated if if embezzlement is happening. And as long as the embezzler is the person who takes that call, they deal with it. Oh, Mary, I'm really sorry about that. We had somebody in here working on accounts, and they were making a lot of mistakes, so we had to let them go. Um, but the main thing is that your balance is right. Um, and that you're happy with the work that we did. And, you know, if, if 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 you called into a practice and you got an answer like that, I mean, you just shrug your shoulders and, and move on to something else. And and it's, it's unlikely that would make a lasting impression on you. But if the embezzler is gone, like on vacation, for example, then that call goes to somebody else. And at some point there's there's a pattern that forms, and that person goes into the dentist and says, there's something weird going on here. 
Um, I worked on a very big embezzlement a while ago, and the way that it came to light was that the office manager broke her leg skiing. I mean, she'd never missed a day of work before. And about 1 o'clock or 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, one of the staff interrupted the doctor and said, I've gotten three of these very strange phone calls this morning. Ah, And that was kind of the thread that unraveled the whole thing. So, so it's okay. So it's it's the same sort of concept. Not taking vacation is a variation on don't sit at my desk and I'm gonna I'm gonna be here later. It's just got a slightly different purpose. That's right. It's 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 all about keeping a lid on things that, if they came to the doctor's attention, would cause the doctor concern. Huh. What are, what are some other what are some other flags to look for? Are there others? There are. There are a lot of them. Um, one one thing that embezzlers will do sometimes is they'll give reports to the doctor late, and this is this is a way of making your scrutiny of those reports less meaningful. In other words, if you're looking at the day end report at five o'clock today, you have a pretty good memory of what happened today. And if uh, John Smith, who was in to get uh, get a root canal, isn't on the report at the end of the day, you'd question that. On the other hand, if you're looking at that same report three days later it's a little bit less likely that you will remember that, yes, three days ago I did endo on John Smith and I don't see him on the report. So, I got it. So, I take, so I, ca- I take the cash from John Smith and then I drop him off the report. Or something. Yeah, yeah, something. Okay. So, exactly. so late, late, late reports. Um, yeah. no, I, I've had them where the um, – you ever have this happen? I'm, I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, but – I have the uh, the office manager who's making fifty thousand bucks a year rolls up in a seventy five thousand dollar car, and you kind of wonder what's going on. Is this? Do you ever see this sort of thing as a, an indicator? You certainly do, and that's part of kind of a, a a broader series of things. You know, living living beyond what you think should be somebody's means is a symptom. You know, obviously, it does not mean conclusively that they're. Embezzling. I mean, the office manager might have inherited the money, or you know, maybe the car belongs to her her husband who works at a car dealership and gets you know gets to take different cars home. Um, there there could be other explanations, but living beyond the means is is certainly a symptom. Um, people with gambling issues, drug issues, uh, are are certainly able to be put in a position where they see embezzlement as as the thing they should be doing to solve their problems. Um, the other one that I'll mention is something called conspicuous displays of honesty. Uh, there's a, a, a basic element of human nature that honest people don't have to keep telling you that they're honest. They they yeah. just they just they take just for granted are. that that people are going to assume that they're being honest. Um, and I, I, I was watching an embezzler be deposed the other day. So this is this is kind of in the in, in, in the um, process that's eventually going to lead to a trial. And in her deposition, so she's she's being questioned by an attorney and she's answering. In her deposition, she must have said 15 times the words, I swear to God. And every Good. time she said, I swear to God, what she said next was a great big whopping lie. <laughs> yeah, couldn't help herself, huh? Couldn't help herself, but, but people who are fundamentally honest don't, don't need to keep emphasizing how honest they're being, and and when somebody does, you know, really what what that's indicating is that that honesty is not their normal pattern. Got um, it. Got it. The other place you'll see that is if you go to buy a car from a dealership, and the the, the salesperson will tell you three times that he's the most honest car salesman in Baltimore. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of those. Yeah, there yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, I think we've all we've all seen that one. All right, so we've got all these flags, and I'm a dentist, and I see two or three flags with with one of my staff members. What do I do? What you don't do is let the staff member know that you have concerns. Uh, if if I am stealing from you, and I think I'm about to get caught, I may do the. Uh, dental practice equivalent of a Hail Mary pass. I Which was, is? 
Well, I was having a conversation with a dentist about embezzlement about 10 years ago. And we talked for about 15 minutes. And at the end of that 15 minutes, he decided that he could save some money if he didn't hire us and dug into the problem himself a little bit. And I can sort of picture what happened the next morning in his practice. He probably went to his office manager and asked her for a whole bunch of reports that he never asked for before. And then he went into his private office and shut the door and phoned his CPA. Yeah. And she realized she was going to get caught and that getting caught would probably send her to jail. And so she came back that night with a can of gasoline and burnt his office down. Uh, That's to be avoided. Well, he he said to me afterwards, um, yeah, that was a little bit of a false economy. Um, she she I, was also this was in the days before most people backed up on the cloud so they, they were backing up onto onto these tape drives and of course she was the person doing it so she she put the three of them next to the computer before she lit the match. Yeah, I'll bet, I was I was going to say I'll bet the more common problem is that it gives them time to uh, to, to to hide what they've done or destroy what they've done. Yeah, the the hiding part um, actually helps us a lot. Um, you know, it, it's it um, it takes an activity that might be a little bit hard to detect, and it draws this big red circle around it. And we we love it when people try to conceal what they've done, because it 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 just makes it ten times more conspicuous. So that's that's never a concern, but the destruction absolutely is. And so what what happens? You know, I see these flags, and the example you just used, a guy called his accountant. Um, I think that would probably be my natural reaction too. Is hey, I got a money problem. Call my accountant. Um, what's the difference between you and an accountant? The mistake people make here is that they think that somebody who knows twenty percent more than they do is an expert. Um, the I mentioned the American Dental Association study where they asked embezzlement victims what tipped you off. The answer my accountant found the embezzlement came up four percent of the time. Um, There are a couple of problems here. First of all, to an accountant, your practice management software is a complete black box. They don't understand the first thing about what happens inside that software. They're they're quite good at taking totals from the software and um, putting those totals in, in as the start of their work and then following a process from there. But most embezzlement is concealed inside the practice management software, and that's just somewhere where the accountant has no expertise. Also, most accountants are not fraud investigators, so they don't really have a good insight into how criminals think. And it's just not their expertise. And and, and the analogy I give sometimes is it's kind of like me going to my neighbor, the cardiologist, and saying, do you think I need a root canal? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I run I run into variations on that all the time for me too. Of course. Um, all right, so we're 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 getting to the end of our time here because I want I do want to let people ask questions. What are some things if if there is anything? I mean, I, I see we've talked about there are red flags. What do I do if I see them? But what can I do to avoid the problems in the first place? Are there are there checks and balances? What do you do? so that you don't get stolen from in the first place. Um, Any tips? I'll, I'll, I'll give a, f- a few pieces of advice. First of all, there's no such thing as prevention. If somebody decides they're going to steal from you, they will. And the question is really how long they will get away with it before they get caught. It's very difficult to convert a thief into an honest person. That That takes a control over another human being that we just don't have. So... The idea that if we make it difficult, they won't try is is a fallacy. Um, the idea should be that if they're going to try, I want to catch them. And a few things there. The first thing is this, um, and, and a lot of dentists don't like this advice, but it's absolutely the right thing to do. The reports that you look at at the end of each day and the end of each month should be ones you print yourself. As soon as you allow staff to print reports for you, you open the door to selective reporting, where you think you're getting 
a look at the entire practice and you're not. Hmm, that's interesting. Second piece. I never, of I never heard that one before, but it makes a lot of sense. Can manip- you, they can manipulate what you see. All right. They absolutely. What, can. What, are there, is there another another good tip? Let's leave one more. You got uh, one more. Let's talk about hiring. Um, okay. Dentists tend to trust what people who are applying for jobs tell them. Sixty percent of resumes have some amount of falsehood. Sixty million Americans have criminal records, so that's one in four adults. Um, a lot of hiring is done with, with deficient background checking. We, we need to check criminal records. And here's something really important. We need to talk to references. By references, I mean former employers, and also don't phone any phone number that an applicant gives you. So if they said that they worked for Dr. Jones in, in Chevy Chase, Go to your favorite online search engine, find Dr. Jones's phone number there, and call that number. Otherwise, you may end up talking to the applicant's uncle on a disposable cell phone who pretends to be Dr. Jones and, and, and gives a great reference. Oh, I never... Boy, see, you do think like a crook. That one never would have occurred to me. Yeah, and it doesn't, it doesn't occur to the vast majority of practicing dentists either, which is how they get caught. Wow. Um, All right. So one one last any 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 uh we're going to open it up for questions. You got one last piece of advice you can give everybody? Well, let let's stick to the hiring for a minute. Uh okay. one thing that one thing that astounds me, Steve, is that I cannot get a $12 an hour job at UPS delivering the junk that people buy on Amazon without a drug test. And yet very few dentists drug test applicants. The difference hmm. between U- UPS and the dental practice is UPS doesn't have prescription pads sitting there. Yeah, true enough. Um, I will I will throw out there to anybody who's listening that you got to be careful. You got to check your state law before you do drug testing for folks because there are there are often rules regarding drug testing. But that's interesting because if I'm a not only am I, might I steal a prescription pad, but I can sell the drugs, or if I've got a drug problem, I need money, and that leads to embezzlement, I suppose. Well, those are all true, and, and, and beyond that, you know, pe- the people in your practice get to stick sharp instruments in somebody's mouth. Aren't, aren't you interested in whether or not they might be high when they do it? Uh, there we go. We're going we're gonna to end with a safety tip. I like that. That's good. That's great. All right. Um, Dave, stay on a couple minutes, and we'll, we'll open it up and see what kind of questions folks have. This was awesome. I, le- I learned a lot. You good? We'll open it up for a minute or two? Sure. All right. Let's see. Let's see if I can do this right. There you go, folks. We should be able to hear you all now. Anybody got a question for David? Dave, I have a question for you. All right. Sure. So how is it usually resolved? So you were saying in about two years, uh, over $100,000 can be embezzled from you as a dentist. So how do you recoup that? How long is that process? What's that like? Well, everybody gets something back, and a, a relatively small number of dentists get full recovery from what happens. You all have some insurance coverage for this. The typical amount of coverage that you have is $25,000, which... Um, by the numbers that, that you just gave is, is inadequate. Uh, one of my tips is to check with your insurance company to see if that can be increased. So this is not with your malpractice insurance. It's with your property insurance. So it's it's covered by somebody like State Farm. Um, and we, we conduct an investigation. Investigations typically take about eight or ten weeks. At the end of that process, we hand you a report. You give that report to your insurance company and normally... Without asking any questions, they'll just send you a check. Um, so that that part of the recovery is easy. Getting the rest of your money back can be a lot more challenging, and it might involve uh, what's called a restitution order. So when somebody gets convicted of theft, the judge orders them to pay you back. Um, and, and then you, you get ten dollars a month for the rest of your life. You get ten dollars a month done that. The rest, for the rest of your How life. Again? How are you? If, I'm way behind all this stuff. I could be Darth Vader, right? All right. Sure. You been flossing? If um, if somebody's been taking your checks and cashing them, 
then you have an additional recourse because you have some ability to go after the bank that allowed that to happen. Um, and if in, in that case, your your recovery prospects get a lot better. Thank you. Got that? Any any anybody? That was those were those were some great questions. Anybody else uh, got one? Nobody, bunch of shy folks. All right, I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna go back to that question I wrote down then, <clears throat> which is about remote access. Yeah. Um, is this? I, I could I can envision that remote access is wide open to abuse. Is it a good idea? And if I do it, how do I control it? Um, personally, Steve, I think the only person who should should have remote access in the practice is the doctor. Um, a, cu- a couple of things here, and I and I mentioned that. Embezzlers like alone time. If we force them to take that alone time in the practice, it's monitorable. So the um, almost every practice has an alarm system. In fact, HIPAA pretty much requires it. If you have an alarm system, you can go to the alarm company and say to them, uh, can you please send me what's called the entry log or the access log? So if you do that once a month, they'll email you a log of when people armed and disarmed the alarm in your practice. If you do that, and if if somebody is coming in at weird times, you'll spot it fairly quickly. Um, got it, got it. And and I'll I'll add to that that in in a lot of states you can use cameras that'll catch people coming in. You, vi- video uh, audio is is trickier and is illegal in a lot of places but video is not and you can see folks come in i we've caught we've caught folks who come in crawling on the floor thinking they're evading the camera they know about and they get caught by the one they don't know about it's pretty yeah. interesting to watch yeah and that's that that's all you know that's that's good idea as well but a basic tip just have the alarm company send you this log once a month and take 5 minutes and check it and see if people are coming in at weird times um, the thing about remote access, though, is it's much more difficult to track. Got it. And All right. So the lesson here is don't don't give somebody else remote access. Sim- I'll, simple. I'll, I'll go simple beyond lesson. that, Steve. I'll, I'll go beyond that. Get your IT folks to to check to see if somebody's given themselves remote access. Hmm. Okay. Um, because the, the the way the technology works now, it's not um, it's not hard to give yourself remote access. We can keep going on this. Then I got to have somebody check the IT guy to make sure the IT guy hasn't isn't stealing yeah. from me with remote access. I suppose, but okay. point point well taken. Um, anybody else got a question? Um, Ooh, one last thing. I'll, one last thing I'll mention, Steve, before we we see if there are any more questions. Um, I just want to give people a heads up that because I know a lot of the um, a lot of the audience is probably in the Maryland area. Uh, I'll be speaking at the Maryland State Dental Association on April 26th, which is a Friday, uh, for the morning, and that's at the the MSDA's uh, office in Columbia. So if you, I think, I think you're there in March 26th. Um, you, you you may be right. Um, I, for some reason, I'm looking at April, but uh, let me just check March. Now that you bring that up, uh, March 26th is not a Friday. No, I think it's going to be April. April, okay. Yeah. All right. I was getting um, bad info. All right. Okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's 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 April twenty sixth. I'm I'm looking at the contract right now. So, anyway, if you uh, if if you liked what you heard today and you want a, a a much expanded, richer version of it, I'd love to see you on the on April twenty sixth. It's awesome, and I want to add to that to everybody that next month we'll be interviewing. I'll be interviewing Rich Maddow, who's a national dental coach, and he's going to talk about um, uh, how to avoid some significant problems in your office and give some tips on folks on how to make some more money. Um, and I think, David, we're we're out of time. I really thank you for your time. It's been wonderful. And I will see you, I think, when you're here in Baltimore on March 26th. I'm looking forward to it. Great. Thanks, everybody. See you. uh, Well, I won't see you, but look forward to hearing from you and having you all on the line next month for Rich Maddow.
Thank but you. Bye-bye, all. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.